So good morning and thank you for having us here today. Uh, Thomas and I have actually, um, uh, I was just reflecting the last time I was in Hamburg was actually 19 years ago when we were both working at Razorfish. Uh, so it's, it's um, time's gone by and it's, it's, we've it's, been working again. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Um, so uh, just for some context, Fjord is um, a, a design and innovation consultancy. We sit happily within Accenture Interactive. Um, I'm a co-founder of, of Fjord. We're now about... In fact, over a thousand designers worldwide. Uh, we have 28 studios. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is some stuff that Thomas and I have been talking about recently to do with what's happening in technology and how that's going to affect the way humans converse with each other. In fact, conversation overall. So hopefully a fairly wide and broad and, and um, big topic. Before we go into conversations, a long time ago, Plato uh, wrote about uh, an Egyptian god called Thoth. And um, Thoth was a god of gifts, a bit like Hermes. And he came down and he saw this Egyptian king, Thamis. And he said to Thamis, I have a gift for your people. And Thamis said, very well, what is it? And he described this new, as Plato called it, techne, technology. And it was called writing. And um, he explained to the king what this writing gift was and the, and the things that it would give to his people. And much to his surprise, the king said... Um, Actually, you know what, I need to think about that for a week. Can you come back in a week's time? I'll tell you whether or not I want to accept the gift on behalf of my people. So the god presumably fluttered back to heaven in a bit of a huff um, and, and came back a week later and said, well, how do you feel about it? And to his surprise, this Egyptian king said, actually, I want to decline the gift of writing. Thank you very much. And the god asked him why, and he said, because I believe that my people will forget to remember things if they put all their memories on paper. What Plato was trying to tell us is that for every step forward in technology, we also experience a step back. And I want you to remember that theme as we go through what we're talking about today, because I think it's also something much on all of our minds right now. In fact, the Greeks were also masters of the arts of, of, of conversation. If you look at Greek literature, they, they wrote there, there is a lot written about the way they got together in things called symposia, where they, largely men, I have to say, but they gathered together and they talked about things. They talked about philosophy. Socrates uh, regarded these symposia as places where you examined yourself. And as he said, the unexamined life is, is not worth living by a human being. And conversation was a way of examining yourself. Conversation actually was then very important uh, throughout history. And, and if I just pick on a couple of moments, uh, in my own hometown, London, um, coffee houses developed in pff, roughly... 17th, 18th century, they were huge in London. They've come back, of course, now, but different kind of coffee house. And the coffee houses were all about conversation. Even a Frenchman acknowledged that the British were masters of the art of conversation at this time because of their coffee houses. And then the French took the idea and they developed, and this actually did involve women at this stage, uh, who largely curated and hosted salons in Paris in the 18th century, where many of the ideas that founded the Enlightenment and then the Revolution took place through conversation. So conversation it has been a big part of, of, of history, and we could spend many hours looking at different examples. Um, but then we get technology. So if you think about all those conversations that I talked about, the Greeks drank wine copiously at their symposia, um, the British drank coffee in their coffee houses, and the French drank wine at their salon and tea. The only technology we had to aid the conversations were drugs, in effect. More recently, and literally in the last 150 to 180 years, we've seen other kinds of technology come in and, and disrupt and enhance and, and, and take over our conversation. So let's just have a very swift look at, at what that means. So initially, letters uh, on the left-hand side there conferred permanence on conversations. So we can still go back and we can see letters from the Middle Ages and beyond which actually tell us something about the conversation going on, for example, between Abelard and Eloise uh, in the Middle Ages, famous uh, lovers, uh, one a monk and the other a nun, so they shouldn't really have been lovers. Um, but, but we can see that conversation, and it's bestowed permanence on that conversation. Um, but also, it's asynchronous. So um, there's a telegram up there, which actually is a personal one. I discovered it when my mother died this year, which informs her that her fiancé had died in the Second World War. Now, there was nothing she could do about that. It was a completely asynchronous conversation. She couldn't respond to it. So what these things did, telegrams and letters, 
is that they introduced a sense of asynchronicity into conversations, which if you didn't have those technologies, all conversations would otherwise be synchronous. So you see a major change at that stage. Then we get the telephone coming in, and what the telephone does is it brings back synchronicity so that you can talk and respond at the same time in the conversation. But what you lose at that stage is distance. So, you know, we've written, a lot has been written about the death of distance with the internet, but actually telephones had already started that journey uh, back in the late 19th century. They had made distance less relevant because you could talk to people a long way away. And then we get this thing coming along, for those of you who remember modems uh, or remember this. I still have nightmares listening to that. Um, so what did this do? <laughs> what did this do? What it did was that it introduced interactivity into our conversations. I'll go back. It introduced interactivity into our conversations. So, and I remember uh, when I first set up an agency back in 1993 with a guy called Mike Beeston in London, we spent a lot of time earnestly talking about what is new about what is happening now, what is different what is happening, and the word we fixed on was interactive, because for the first time, you could talk back at a medium. And, and, and that now seems extraordinarily antiquated to be talking like that, but genuinely in 1993 and 94, that was new. What we didn't quite see then, but has become super clear since then, was that the internet has destroyed privacy. So one step forward, one step back. Um, and, and privacy, I think, has become a big issue, and you know, large companies and governments also see that now. It's very difficult to keep secrets anymore. So as all of these things have happened, what we've also seen has been a proliferation of etiquettes, and we've had more and more new media coming along and, into, and, and taking part or becoming media for our conversations. Email, instant messaging, Twitter. And with each of these, you see changes and shifts in the, and I think it's an important word, the etiquette of conversation, the way in which we expect to go about it. So what we do with email, for example, where there is a finite ending, I still, maybe sadly, say kind regards, or thank you, or whatever, and mark at the end, that's not the same as the way in which I work with instant messaging, or WhatsApp, for example, where conversations don't have a very clearly defined beginning or end. Uh, they certainly don't have endings, they perhaps have a beginning, but if it's a stream of consciousness you're having with somebody else which is interrupted by time, then there isn't really a clear beginning and end. So again, what this does, subtly but importantly, is it completely shifts the etiquette of the way in which we have conversations. And I suggest that what happens with, with this is that we're now having to load balance all the time different kinds of etiquette of conversation which our predecessors 200 years ago simply didn't have to do. But we do this all the time. We manage different styles of, of conversation. And, and that's just the internet, and then we get these things coming along. Smartphones, um, you know, 10 years ago, more or less, uh, the iPhone introduced. And what that has introduced, I think, is a degree of spontaneity to the conversations that we have over distance, which was not there before, because we can have them anytime, any place. But what it has Taken, or what is taken away, and, and I think the next speaker is speaking about this, and I actually wrote, this is what I wrote my book about in 2005, is it is, it is delivered, it has been, a, smartphones in particular are a distraction medium. They help us prioritize the elusiveness of the distance and what might be out there against what's actually right in front of your face at any given moment. And, and we all see the challenges that is introduced to conversations, real con live conversations in society. And what they've also done is they've introduced more media. So SMS, social media, chat apps, and all of these, again, have introduced a whole bundle of new etiquettes that come with them, all of which, again, we're managing all the time. So SMS, for example, is very insistent, but it's a character-limited uh, conversation. Social media is, is synchronous. You can chat with people, but also you can pause it as well and move away from it. Um, Chat apps, as I mentioned earlier, are synchronous, but they've also introduced video and audio into our digital conversations, and that too is a step forward, and I'll come back to some of that in a moment. So what does all of that mean to us? So how do we respond to that? What does it mean to be human in a digital age? And I think what we've seen, particularly over the last 20 years, is an effort to put 
the richness of face-to-face -face conversation back into digital media. And that's been a trend underpinning a lot of what's happened. I mean, this is horrible. This is completely inhuman. But it's what many of us who were involved early in, in technology used to regard as the norm. But there's nothing, and maybe a coder would tell me otherwise, there's nothing I can see in here which is particularly human. And if there is, you've got to decode it in your head. It's not, it's not startlingly obvious. But actually, body language, as we all know, is hugely important to us. There's a whole theory about mirroring. So mirroring is what we do all the time when you have people <laughs> crossing their arms. And what these two are doing is they're showing body language. I mean, it's a fairly extreme, particularly in the top right-hand corner, but they're demonstrating and they did not mirror each other. If you look at the famous uh, debates, there was no mirroring going on between, it, between them because they clearly loathed each other and mirroring was not appropriate. But when we're talking with each other, if we're getting on, then actually mirroring is something we do all the time. And I think what's been happening is that we've been trying to introduce mirroring and body language back in. And that's what emojis are all about. So it's actually quite astonishing. A couple of thousand years of letter writing and nobody thought of putting emojis into letters. I've scanned them and I can't find any. As soon as we get a keyboard, and we start doing conversations over digital, we realize that we put together a colon and a, and, and a parenthesis, and you can do a smiley. What is a smiley if not a form of body language coded into a digital conversation? That's exactly what almost all of them are, and of course they've exploded. And then I think what's happened, and one of the reasons why uh, pictures have become so important, is because pictures, and that's why selfies are so important, because they're putting a form of body language. Okay, it's pretty simplistic, it's generally just a smile or a wave or whatever it may be, but it's still, if you like, an intrinsic effort by ourselves and why they've become so popular, to communicate who we are via body language along with text to people. And then we get video. Oh, good, sounds working. So. Um, I'm showing you this video because it's, it's personal to me, but, and, 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 and that's an important part of the story. So I was somewhere in another part of the world, not um, in London where I live, or south of London, and um, this was sent to me on WhatsApp by a family member, pretty much live as it was happening. And it's my 10-year-old son, and he's playing drums at school. And you can't quite hear it because his volume's not high enough, uh, but he's drumming to Smells Like Teen Spirit, which, which completely blew me away. I didn't know he was going to do this. And what I saw was a lot of body language. So if you're watching carefully, what I saw when I saw this wherever I was, was that the people in front in the video actually turn to each other and they lift when they realize that this kid is about to place a song by Nirvana. And also, what I see out of this is that Billy is concentrating. Now, he's 10, he doesn't concentrate that easily. Uh, but boy, is he concentrating when he's doing this. All of this, lots of body language coming to me over video, delivered to me over WhatsApp, etc., etc. It's all coming through. Uh, because we put body language through video back into, um, back into the conversation. And then the next thing that happens, and this is happening now, is we're seeing conversation becoming actually the interface. And we're seeing that through all sorts of stuff. It's really been, as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's really been pioneered by WeChat uh, in, in China. And what WeChat saw was that not only is conversation uh, interface, it's also a market. Um, and, um, <clears throat> oh God, I'm trying to remember the name of the book um, 10 years ago that wrote Conversations and Markets. Um, it'll come to me in a moment. Clutrain. Thank you. So Clue Train Manifesto predicted this. They said Conversations and Markets, and of course they are. That's why we all gathered in the market square, not just to exchange goods, but also to exchange news and knowledge, etc., etc. And that's what's happening here. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we're using conversational interfaces as a marketplace as well. So now we're beginning to see a lot of stuff happening. And now we have another uh, interrupter coming in, another new thing coming in, which is, which is voice. And voice is becoming very important, and there's a paradox here, which is that phone calls are, are in decline. Um, one CEO of a telco I heard talking recently in Asia was saying that they are now actively planning to make no revenue at all from voice within five years. That's going in their business plans. And if you look at the way my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, actually can't do phone calls. She doesn't understand the etiquette of phone calls. Um, and I could do a mime for you what happens, but fundamentally when I call her, she doesn't understand why I'm calling her. And, and, and there's a lot of background noise, she doesn't follow the flow of the conversation, and I give up after a minute. And I've, I've teased her about this, and she just laughs and says, Dad, you're just too old. <laughs> so, 
Phone calls are going down, but we know, because we're seeing it happen, voices on the rise. And in fact, um, these things are now happening. Um, voice interactions aren't going to need a phone, so you're probably aware, but um, what Amazon have done with Echo is they're launching some software which allows one Echo to speak to another within a household as a kind of intercom. So I'm planning to put a silent dot underneath my son's bed so I can yell at him when he's reading with the light on late at night. Uh, but more seriously, it will allow a family to communicate across the building. But then, clearly what's going to happen next is it'll allow us to speak to each other in, in, in other places uh, because we'll link up our, 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 our devices, whether they're an Echo or whether they're a Google at home or something else, we'll link them up. And the next thing that's going to happen, I think we can confidently predict, is they won't just be devices we talk at, that's not a conversation, they will be devices that talk to us and when we haven't asked them to as well. That's clearly going to happen, and in, already there is at least one company working with um, Amazon in the US on delivering alerts to you uh, through, Ec through Alexa in order to make this happen. Um, so, and then, then the next thing that's happening, so I'm building up all of these things, hopefully you can see, which are sort of changing the pattern and rhythm and cadence of our conversations, are, are bots. Um, and, and artificial intelligence, of course. And, and in fact, the significance of bots to some extent, from, from our point of view, is that they are the places we will largely experience artificial intelligence directly, at least initially, and then it will broaden out from there. Um, but they are important, and I, I'm afraid you, can't, you, oh, you probably can see some of the detail on here. I think some of the really interesting things about bots are what people are saying about them. So even a year ago, uh, we were having earnest conversations where people drew up quite stiff battle lines about whether or not a bot should be um, humanized or not. Should it be more uh, chat, human, warm, friendly, or should it be more bot, hard, technical, cold, and aloof? And, and I think that it's beginning to become clear that what humans want is chatbots which are more chat than bot, because they want to have those relationships. Uh, Two colleagues of mine in America have some interesting stories. One bought Alexa for her, uh, bought Echo for her father, who lived in another state, who's 75, and she sent it to him, or got Amazon to send it to him. And she phoned him up, phone call, and said, uh, Dad, you know, how are you getting on with, with, with Echo? And rather sheepishly, he said, I think I'm falling in love with Alexa. Uh, another colleague has a son who packed Google at home in the suitcase to go away on holiday and didn't tell his parents until they got to the resort and they opened it up. And he said, why did you do this? And he said, I couldn't leave Google at home. Now, I like, I like those stories because I think what those stories do is they indicate we want our chatbot, we want our, our artificial stuff, we want these devices to be human. We like that and we build relationships with them. You may not like that, but I think it's where things are going. And some of these statistics say that that's the case. 87% of people think artificial intelligence should be able to detect and react to our emotions. So the implication of that is that they should be able to read our emotions, should be able to read our body language. 68% um, of people said, yes, I expect AI to fulfill my needs before I ask. So that, I think, goes to prove some of the stuff we were just saying about being predictive. So that's a rapid, very rapid, trot through conversations and where it's taken us to now. I'm going to hand over to Thomas to talk about what does this mean for brands? Thank you, Mark. So that's a really rich picture in many ways that Mark painted for us here, where conversation came from, um, the importance of, of body language, the importance of the role of, of mirroring emojis, and then where technology has taken us. Um, if I were a CMO or a brand manager, I probably would have one of two reactions. I'd either be scared shitless or I'd be, wow, <laughs> the future actually might look um, really bright because in many ways, all I, all I have to do is I'm going to just wire an AI-powered chatbot to drive all of my brand conversations and the world is just going to be fine because apparently, as those last stats told us, consumers um, claim that they want that and the technology is getting better and better. Um, and if chatbots are very quickly catching on and really evolving, they're also going to master the art of body language and mirroring, and um, we're going to be in just a fine place. They learn, they will learn faster um, than we. The question is, is this really 
where my brand wants to go and where it should go. Part of the answer is it's always good to once again look back how branding and the art and science of building brands has evolved over the last century. And it's pretty much gone from a path of it was easy to launch a product because there was either nobody like you or you just simply had to focus on the functional benefits. Um, and that, that approach really lasted for quite a while. As we got into the 50s and the rise of advertising, um, Madison Avenue, Hamburg, etc., we started to lay on that component of really you needed to tell a story, you needed to connect, you needed to give people a reason to see themselves in it in order to pick one over the other. We move into the era when we spent time, um, even in Hamburg, at, uh, in those days from Razorfish, and we started to add on the art of really crafting interactions. If we move, move even further forward, the conversation about a successful brand has become, how do I create an experience that is seamless and makes sense across all media? Along that spectrum, you could in broad strokes say, we have moved from an uninformed consumer to a much more informed consumer, um, which the internet certainly um, added that power to it. Are we ready to move our, our brands into the era of conversation? Are brands ready? What do they have to master? And will the consumer actually stay as informed, um, or will the brand, with those AI-powered chatbots um, behind it, um, know more about us and therefore create maybe a duality of sure informed but less informed. Um, successful brands all the time have essentially um, really hit a home run if they mastered um, the four dimensions of a brand. Who am I? What do I stand for? Um, what's my really clear story and my promise that I have? What are some core values that ultimately guide what we say, what we do, what we um, offer to the marketplace, and then most importantly, um, based on that foundation, how do we express that? How do we, uh, how do we come across? When you look into that dimension of expression, um, very clearly, it spans from the visual side of things, um, the verbal side of things, how do we sound, and, and touch. In a world of conversation, obviously there's going to be an increasing emphasis for your brand um, on those um, middle two. If we look for an example, some very digital brands today have clearly mastered um, delivering infinite experiences pretty much um, anywhere. When you look at Spotify, where it started and where it is today, they absolutely have mastered having a very strong um, strategic platform, they are very clear about their DNA, but they've also really unleashed um, the power of their brand to both be a platform and act as a platform, because what they've done along that journey is um, they managed the atomization that was required um, by building a very flexible system. If you look to the very um, left of this, I would say that's that's a Tower Records. Um, they clearly um, did not manage at their point in time, and I used to love that store, um, and they were everywhere, and I lived for a long time in New York City, but both their business model and how they treated their brand was very much frozen in a solid state. If you move more to what, what we describe, what I would call a liquid state of managing your brand, you might be in the publishing realm, you, you, you could say these are the record labels, and as we move to the left, um, having a gases-like state to really manage your brand. Um, we are in the big platforms. You could say we're in a, in a Google end as well as in Apple Music. But really, if you create your brand in a way that it can flow anywhere, it can offer itself as a platform um, and play on other platforms, that is what successful brands um, need to manage. And to do that, what we um, work on with our clients is to wrap sort of like this layer of intelligence around a brand so that this brand DNA, which is crafted very carefully and thoughtfully, but also, um, if not combined with this intelligence around it, remains static, you need to understand the data around it, and most importantly, the brand needs to understand who am I, what am I thinking right now, um, and what's the context in which I am for the brand to ultimately make the transition to be um, a living brand? A parallel stream along that is 
As we've seen this movement um, and the digitization of everything, things are disappearing. We've also seen what I will call the miniaturization um, of digital. We used to work for very, really, really big and bulky devices, but at this point in time, um, the screens that we carry with us may be the last actual haptic or visual experience um, that we are working towards. And eventually, maybe all we're left with is voice and sound. So if that's what your brand will use to create preference, um, tell stories that matter, drive your business as a brand manager, I suddenly need to um, be prepared to have machine learning in my capabilities. Um, I need to take that tone of voice guide that um, guided a copywriter and a content strategist and transform those into brand voice libraries so that machine learning plus brand voice libraries are able to really say the right things in the right point in time, and that obviously also requires um, to have natural language processing as a capability in your brand um, shop. Now, it's a really interesting time then for designers, and especially content designers, because suddenly it's a huge open field that we can work for and aim for, because suddenly conversations for brands need to be designed. And at minimum, they need to be designed so that those AI-driven brand chatbots um, pass the first test of being a thinking machine. Can they actually make sense of the world? Can they anticipate user needs? Do they understand the larger business context in which we are? And hopefully not leave me hanging, but resolve um, an unfortunate um, situation. But most of the examples that are out there are certainly not um, great. This is an, a, a weather chatbot um, that we recently downloaded, and it's trying to be very human. Hey, how are you? I hope it's sunny where you currently are. Would you like me to look up the weather forecast in your suburb? Which, okay, some bot is trying to be very friendly and human with me, but really what's behind it is it's just a link um, to the actual weather forecast, so an app to use an app um, in order to make sense of the world. It is a, a sad example that barely probably passes the thinking um, lever. But you want to get, and we want to get, the brands that we work on even beyond the thinking level and really get them ready for being feeling um, machines. So picking up on the, on the theme of empathy, picking up on the theme of um, body language, picking up on the theme of really being sure that um, that chat AI brand bot understands form, understands content, but most importantly understands um, context. So where could all of this be going if we add um, artificial intelligence, if we master the art of voice, while at the same time things seem to be disappearing and we are all working through this miniaturization of digital. Well, the beautiful state could be, um, we will find ourselves in a conversational singularity. Everything that your brand does and everything that we create to get that brand ready is a conversation in an ether of conversations that are all around that um, brand. Because devices are disappearing, or they're shrinking, they certainly will less and less depend on a visuality, and it's just the conversation that remains between us and between a brand, and between a brand and the audiences that it really, in a meaningful way, tries to engage with. So, Mark, what are the implications? So, if this is true, and the devices disappear and just the conversation remains, and, and all the things that we've talked about, I think there are some very important things to think about. So I touched on earlier on the importance of etiquettes and tried to communicate the range of different etiquettes that we're now juggling with. If what Thomas has said is true, artificial intelligence, devices disappear, um, voice UI, we're going to need more etiquettes because we can all hear some of the things we were saying earlier about where Alexa and Google, Google at Home are going, for example, and think, do we actually want that? What's the right etiquette? for a machine to speak to me without me asking to speak to it? How do I finish the conversation? How do I start it up, etc.? The second implication, and we saw startling evidence of this on the front cover of The Economist just two weeks ago, 
is that machines will know us better than we know ourselves. How many people have heard of clever hands? Has anyone heard the story of clever hands? It's a German story, actually.、Um, so, clever hands was a horse in 19th century, late 19th century Germany. This is true. I'm not making it up. And he could do maths. And his owner took him around fairs, and for money would challenge people to give him a maths problem. And then clever hands would answer the problem by tapping his hoof on the ground the number of times. That it was required to give the answer. So if it was like four plus five, clever hands would tap his hoof nine times. And nobody knew how he did this. And everybody suspected it was a trick, but they couldn't figure it out. And they put a team of scientists on it, they couldn't figure it out either. Eventually, after a couple of years, the psychologists studied it. And what the psychologists determined was that the horse was able to read minute signs in our faces and our body language. Was giving away excitement as he got close to the correct answer. So when he got to nine, yeah. So machines are now able to do this. We're seeing it happen very, very quickly. And if you doubt, go back to the Economist from a couple of weeks ago because the, the evidence is, is startling.、Um, so machines are going to know us better than other humans. And that's quite challenging when you think about the notion I introduced right at the beginning from Socrates of the unexamined life. So Machines will be examining us and will be able to learn from them. And, and I, you know, it's actually difficult to project exactly what that's going to mean. I just think it's a question we need to begin to ask ourselves is how are we going to feel about that and how will we interact with it? So the questions that that drives out then are how are we going to use technology to enhance brand conversations, which is the, the point that, that Thomas was driving at, which is that if all of this is true, it has really significant implications for brands. Do brands become like us? So, if you follow the logic of it, every single person that interacts with a brand will get a different experience. That means that the brand is atomizing not just over a number of platforms, but it's atomizing one million times a day if there are a million customers interacting with it. And the brand becomes like me. Do we want that? Do the brands want it? Do we want it? It may well be where we're heading. The second, age is, second question is can we go back to some kind of golden age of conversation? I'm not really a big believer, I'm a historian in fact, but I, I, I'm not a big believer in golden ages. But is there something we can recapture from the past that we need that we don't want to lose? And, and lastly, if you think about data as, as, as stuff that you can mine in the future, will actually conversations last forever? Because the technology is there now to record this conversational singularity and have it being recorded all the time. That would be a major but potentially challenging step forward in the way in which we think about conversations if they last forever. So I'll leave you with one thought. There is a distinction, I think, between technology, computers, and ourselves. So we're getting very close to a point where computers can do empathy and love, but the question we need to ask ourselves is can they actually mean? Empathy and love. And I hold on to the idea that actually that's questionable. We're the ones that can mean empathy and love. So, from Thomas and I, thank you very much for having us here today. And remember to love. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas and Mark. <laughs> Fellas. Did, did, before you take your microphones off, I, there, there's time for a question if you don't mind taking one. Does anyone, does anyone have a question for the fellas? There's, there's a whole bunch of them out there.、Uh, here's, here's a fellow right here and,、uh, with, a, with a kind of a, a short sleeve shirt on. I'm, I'm slightly confused. I,、uh, I also think that、um, uh, devices will go away, will shrink, will get, become invisible,、uh, and, and、uh, voice communication will rise. But visualization will not go away. You know, Amazon now is,、uh, is experimenting with an Alexa with a screen, and you won't be able to, to sell shoes to, to people that can't see the shoes. So it might be augmented glasses, it might be any fancy technology, but visualization will play its part、we'll、in the future,、first. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you, but in order to get us ready for thinking、uh, or really mastering、um, the art of conversation, if it is not humans who are facilitating that dialogue, I think it's important to go to the extreme of what if visuals were completely、um, to disappear. 
And, and to be fair, we've also had quite a... And within Fjord, um, we've had quite a lot of quite big arguments over whether screens disappear or not. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I don't think they are going to disappear. Um, but it's, it's an interesting debating point, and I don't think it's quite clear. I, personally, I don't think they will. There's a, there was a question right up front, and it was right up front. No, it's, it's, it's you, you, sir. Oh, but you're looking for the microphone. I get it. My question would be, I, we keep seeing her, and you guys showed Sean Young from Blade Runner. Am I the only nerd who saw Ex Machina? I feel like we're missing out on the key femme fatale AI. But anyway, you've got the microphone. Yeah. Um, with all these conversations um, and, and screenless interfaces, um, what about discoverability and the expectation of, of brands that people, you know, go to them and say, okay, let me talk to them. So is it, is it in the hands of the gatekeepers to, to do that discoverability? So I see a huge challenge and not so much an opportunity there. This is an absolutely enormous question right now. Um, and, and actually, I've spent some of the last week uh, studying that. Fairly superficial level. Study is too big a word, but looking at it. Um, so it turns out that with Alexa in the US, um, the recommendation system basically um, only has two recommendations to offer you. So if you ask for maple syrup, I actually asked for maple syrup this week to Alexa, and it didn't work very well. But if you ask for maple syrup, actually, it did work. But if you ask, there's only two recommendations in there, and one is based on what you've bought before, and the other, we think, is based on what Alexa has been paid to present. Um, we think. It's not always super clear. And in fact, that lack of clarity, I think, is a big problem, which Amazon are going to have to sort out. But they only rotate the recommendations very rarely, and that is documented. So there's only two in there. So this thing, is, this thing about discovery is really, really huge, and you could take a line out of it and argue that um, own, people who already own big, well-known brands, Nutella is one that springs to mind because I've got lots of children. Um, so Nutella is a, it's an easy brand to say. It's easy to remember. They, the brand value in that is enormous for them because I would not be wanting to launch a chocolate hazelnut spread into the market where a lot of stuff is drawn, you know, driven by voice UI. The degree to which screens come back in is important because a lot of us in supermarkets choose products visually. So, for example, in my case, I don't know the names of shampoo products. It's just not interesting to me. But I know the shampoos we have in our house, and I can pick them out visually, but I don't actually know the brand name. I, I may be unusual in that, but I suspect it's true for a lot of things. So, Brands which are reliant on visual communication are going to struggle in an era of voice UI. Brands which already have a very strong verbal identification, this is our theory, will, will do well. So I think you're asking really the right question. The only other thing I would add to it is um, what happens in the space of being able to actually read and interpret thoughts. Sc scary topic, um, but we've actually worked um, on it a couple of years ago yep. when we um, managed to design a functional interface uh, for somebody who is an ALS sufferer and ultimately was wearing a very simple brainwave reading um, he headband in order to um, manage to still live a acceptable life, was able through um, his thoughts to control simple interfaces like turning on the light, managing temperature, um, etc. So, Ahead of us, what dimension will our thoughts play in terms of discoverability and managing or exploring, discovering a universe of options? Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas and Mark. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>